as you know, for the past several weeks, we've been studying in this uh, model prayer. The disciples looked at Jesus' life and, and of all the many attributes that he had, there was one thing that really seemed to stand out to them. And they said, Lord, teach us to pray. We want to pray like you pray. And, and so Jesus gave them what we've come to know as the Lord's Prayer. It's actually a model that Jesus used to teach his disciples about the various aspects of prayer. And we've been going through this. Of course, we pray it every every Sunday, and many churches, many Christians pray it every Sunday, and that's a wonderful thing. But if that's all you do, I think you'll miss out so much about the power of this prayer. And I hope you've seen some of this thing, that this brief, short prayer is so deep, so majestic, so powerful um, because of all that it contains and the meaning um, behind it. Last week, we uh, and I've, I've challenged you to pray it not just weekly, but to pray it daily, at least daily, maybe more than, than daily. And each time you pray it, focus on a particular aspect of the Lord's Prayer. One small petition, one small phrase of the prayer, and think about it. What does this mean? What did Jesus mean when he, he taught that to his disciples? And what does this mean for me today in my life? How am I to pray this prayer? And so we've been going through this. And um, last week we talked about forgiveness. Asking for forgiveness for ourselves, which we all need. You know, we, we definitely need that. But then Jesus taught his disciples to pray something in addition to asking for forgiveness for ourselves, which we all recognize we need, but to go that second step and to forgive others. And then even worse than that, to me, is to pray that God will forgive us as we forgive other people. I don't know about you, but sometimes that's a pretty scary prayer. Sometimes there's things going on in my life, sinful stuff going on in my life, and I'm not always ready to forgive that person. I have to confess to you that sometimes I don't pray for God's forgiveness for these others and and for me to forgive them, but sometimes I ask for God's judgment to come down. I, I confess like telemarketers and these people that scam other people, Sometimes I pray that God's going to judge them and not, and I don't ask for forgiveness uh, for them, just thinking of spending a career taking advantage. But that's my sinfulness and, and um, just one example of, of such a thing. But that's kind of scary to pray that God will forgive me the way I forgive other people. And if I don't forgive other people, God's not going to forgive me. That ought to be a wake-up call for us all, and certainly is for me. And then right after that, Jesus continues after asking for forgiveness, and he says, and then lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And some passages say, deliver us from um, the evil one, who was Satan. It literally means, forgive us from the evil. And that, so interpreters will say, well, that must be the evil one, that's Satan. Or others just leave it, and um, translators just say, uh, for evil. But, you know, as we, as we pray this, have you ever thought, why do we need to pray to God not to lead us into temptation? You ever thought about that? God's a good God. God wants what's best for his people. Is God going to lead us to do bad and evil things? You ever thought about that? That's certainly not what what it means. Um, But why do we need to ask God to deliver us from evil? Didn't Jesus give us victory over Satan when he died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins? And when he rose again, he broke the power of sin and death. Didn't God give us victory over death at that point? Yes, he did. 
But these battles rage on. Remember a few weeks ago we talked about living in the already not yet when we were talking about the kingdom of God. And uh, the kingdom has come. Jesus, when Jesus was on earth, he said the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is near. Um, You know, it's right here. It's all around us. I am the kingdom of God that's come down out of heaven to earth. And we pray that God's will be done on earth just like it is in heaven. And but we're living in that already not yet time when Christ has come. He was here for a short time. He after he did his work, he ascended to his father in heaven there. He's still ruling in heaven. He's he's at a place of authority at the right hand of God, the father almighty. And he is praying for us, interceding for us. It's a wonderful thing. But a time is coming when God's judgment is going to come. And this peaceful, good shepherd, this this leader, this this sacrificial servant is going to come back in a different form. He's going to come down as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And the entire world is going to know when Jesus comes again. And this time he's coming as a judge. And he's going to separate those who have resisted uh, his offer of salvation. And he's going to gather them and eternally banish them into hell. And he's going to gather the rest of us. Those who have called on the name of Jesus Christ. And he's going to take us to the most glorious place that we can possibly imagine. In the presence of God. And we will see him as he is. Right now we can't even do that. God is so awesome, so big. If we were, would see him face to face, we'd die. We aren't able to handle it yet. But there's a time coming when he's coming again. But we're living in that already not yet time. And right now, the prince of darkness, Satan, the prince of darkness, is the prince of this world. And there is evil and there's bad stuff in this world. And you and I, are tempted and are drawn to that bad stuff. If if um, sin wasn't tempting, it'd be easy to resist. None of us would struggle with it, would it? Would us? Would we? But sin has the appearance of good. But then it ensnares us. It entangles us. It makes it hard to get out of. And we have these these addictions to things, these these drives, these appetites for things that that aren't good. And how do you get rid of uh, of an appetite? You think, well, if you just feed it, you give it more and more. You know, if you get hungry, well, I want to eat, right? If you have an addiction to food, you want to eat and eat and eat. But what happens? Does that satisfy your addiction? No, you just want to eat more. You you have to starve an addiction to decrease the desire for it. If you feed it, it just increases. For material stuff, when is enough? You look at some people and you think, okay, they're a billionaire now. Why do they need and want to make more money? What is that drive that says, and when do you say, enough's enough, I don't need any more money. But sometimes people are, are addicted to stuff. And they think more and more will satisfy us. But it doesn't. So that's the way sin is. Sin never satisfies us. Only a full personal relationship with Jesus Christ gives us the fulfillment. It's a void that only Jesus Christ um, can fulfill. Last week... Um, In our new members class, we looked at Genesis 3. And why did we do that? Because Genesis 3, it's the passage that talks about the fall of of mankind, Adam and Eve. And and Satan, the tempter, came to to Eve and, and began to twist and distort the truth. And she offered them some fruit. And the fruit looks pretty good. But God had given them one One law, one rule, one thing to obey. There's this one tree over there. Don't eat from that. Everything else you can have. There was perfect peace, perfect harmony, 
There was no death, no disease, no weeds growing in the garden. Everything was good. Adam and Eve walked and talked um, with God in the afternoon. They had a perfect, open relationship. Adam and Eve were, were perfectly vulnerable to one another. And there was no arguing, no fussing, no jealousy. There was no strife between them. Everything was perfect. There was just one tree. So what did Satan do? Huh. Looks pretty good, doesn't it? You'll become like God if you eat it. And so Eve said, hmm, sounds like a good idea to me. Hey, what, what could be worse? Things are great right now. So she ate it. Not only that, but she gave a little bit to Adam. He said, no, eat, no, no, no. Remember what God said. We have all we need. No, Adam, he ate some too. And immediately the world changed. Everything changed. People from, have been covering up, running and hiding from God. Struggling Now the world, there's a curse on the world. There are consequences to our sin and our behavior. And if we don't understand Genesis 3, we can't understand the gospel. We can't understand our, our need for forgiveness. You know, are you a good person? A lot of people say, yeah, I'm a pretty good person. Hey, brother, have you been saved? Saved from what? They don't understand Genesis 3, so they don't understand the need for the cross. They don't understand the need for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, and so we, we have to start there with Genesis 3. But then, right after Genesis 3, you know, we had this perfect world that God created. You know, there was no sin, there was perfect union. Uh, everything was wonderful. And then, then you had... Um, this sin came in. Everything changed. We can't imagine how much things changed in the world and all the consequences that we face now. But then in, in chapter 4, um, Adam and Eve had a couple of kids. And they, and they, they started out and, well, there's trouble between the kids. There's strife between the kids. And one of them ended up killing the other one. But in, in verse uh, 4... Um, it says, and then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Sin is crouching at your door. Do you ever feel like that? Do you ever feel like, man, did you ever think, when I, when I was younger, I thought, man, I can't wait to get a little bit older and, and some of these temptations in life are going to go away. How many of you here have, have reached that point in life where you don't have any temptations? You don't struggle with that anymore. You know? It never leaves, does it? It's always there. What we struggle with might change, but we still struggle, don't we? Sin is crouching at the door. And it wants to, um, it desires to have you, but you must master it. And so one of the reasons that Jesus said, do not lead us into temptation, is that we are in the midst of a daily struggle. Just like we need daily bread, we're in the midst of a daily struggle. We're in the midst of a spiritual war. And we need to daily ask for forgiveness. We need to daily ask God to deliver us from this evil one. We need to ask God to lead us. Scripture says in James 7, James, James, there's no James, James um, 1, 3, that God doesn't tempt us. 
but God will test us. And as God tests us, he draws us closer to him. And as we persevere through the testing, we become more mature. Have you ever gone through that in your life? You just, you just feel like, man, as soon as I stand up, somebody swats me and hits me back down. And, um, and yet it draws me closer to God in the midst of the trials and the tribulations. When you're going through struggles, sometimes doesn't that draw you closer to God? You feel like God is closer. Now, sometimes when we're in struggles, it feels like God's a long ways away from me. Like when I pray that the prayers kind of bounce off the ceiling and, and they don't come back. When I read God's word, it, it just doesn't seem as, as watering and refreshing and as nourishing as it is in other times. And usually when that happens, there's sin in my life that just come in. I'm going in the wrong direction and God is trying to corral me back into the right direction. And we have examples all over scripture of these kinds of things where God tests us. You think of Job. Here's a guy who had everything, man. You talk about a guy who had made it in the world. Here was Job. Everything you could think of. And overnight, Satan said, hey, Lord, the only reason Job is serving you is because you've given him everything. I mean, look at what he has. You know, if you take that stuff away, man, he's going to turn his back on you quicker than you can, you can do. And let, let me have at him. And God said, okay, but there are limits. You see, I'm God and you're Satan. You're a created being. And you are submissive to me and my authority. I will allow you to have certain impact on Job. So he did. Everything was taken away from Job overnight. Sickness, uh, his family, his wealth, he, he lost it all. And yet, as you read through this long book, one of the oldest books in the, in the Bible, you find in the end, and, and he's restored. And his friends came, his so-called friends said, um, you know, there's got to be sin in your life. Job said, no, I, I've looked, it's, it's really not, it's not sin. His supportive wife said, well, why don't you just curse God and die? Exactly what he needed at that time, but no. He stood firm. He knew he was seeking the Lord. He knew he was right. And in the end, God restored him. But what, a, what an example of, of somebody being tested of God, used of God, and he became a mature person, just as James talks about um, in, a, in a couple of different passages. Um, and then we come to maybe one of the one of the best. Well, uh, he tests us. James and James four seven. This is another important passage that he says is resist the devil, and he will flee from you. But first, he says you've got to submit to God. So our priority needs to be that God is first. God is in control. And then you have to resist the devil. Don't play with devil. When you know you struggle with a certain area of, of, of temptation, don't, don't play with it. You're playing with fire. You know, if a, if a person um, is an alcoholic, they probably shouldn't be a bartender. They probably shouldn't be witnessing to people in, in bars. Probably not a wise thing to do. It says to flee Satan. Uh, flee that temptation. Stay away from those areas where you know that you're susceptible. You know, Jesus was tempted, wasn't he? After Jesus was baptized, the Bible says that he went out... The Holy Spirit, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, this is the Godhead. God affirmed Jesus at his baptism. This is my beloved Son, whom I love. Uh, you know, listen to this guy. And then the Holy Spirit came upon him and, and led him out into the wilderness where he fasted and prayed for 40 days. And Satan came and tempted him, didn't he? And Satan hit him at the places where he was weakest. I haven't eaten in 40 days. Hey, make some bread out of these rocks. 
That would be a great way to draw attention to yourself or cast yourself down from this high place and let people see, you know, what a great God you are. And how did Jesus resist the temptations? He quoted scripture. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He quoted scripture. But God, the Holy Spirit, led him into this situation where he could be tested. And the difference between Jesus and you and I is that Jesus never gave in to the temptations. In Hebrews, it says that Jesus was tested in every way, just like us. So Jesus understands what it's like to resist sin, to be tempted, to be tested. He was fully God, but he was fully man. And he struggled with with temptation, but he never once gave in. And that's what made him a worthy sacrifice to die in our place for the penalty of our sins. He was the only one who was worthy. But God allowed that testing to happen. Another, just a a classic um, place in in Genesis, back in, in Genesis, We see this as a whole Bible, and it's one story from Genesis to Revelation. It's not just the the New Testament. Well, we're a New Testament church, and we need to focus here. If you don't understand uh, the Old Testament, you can't understand the New Testament. But then there was a place where God tested Abraham. Now, Abraham was a really special dude to God. God chose him to bring about this whole nation of people. Now, he was really old, can't go into all this, but but anyway, he was an old man. Sarah was an old lady uh, when they had their son, Isaac. Fulfillment of a promise. It was impossible for this to happen, and yet God made it happen. Even his name Isaac means he laughed because Sarah laughed and said, you're going to have a baby. <laughs> are, you, are you serious? Do you know how old I am? Really? Yeah. And it came true. They had to wait a while. It took longer. They, had, um, you know, Abraham said, "Well, maybe I ought to take matters into my own hands and uh, let's have this." Uh, maybe he means this this uh, servant, this slave here, and maybe that's how I'm going to have a child. But no, that wasn't God's perfect plan. But anyway, here are Abraham and Sarah, and they had this boy. Can you imagine how much they loved that little boy? How special he was. That a nation of people was going to come through this, this young boy. He's mine. God gave us, to, gave us this son. So sometime later in Genesis 22, God tested Abraham. And he said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. And then God said, Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the one of the mountains that I will tell you about. Wait, 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 wait a minute, Lord. I thought you said you wanted me to take my son, my only son, the gift that you gave me, and you wanted me to to sacrifice him on some mountain over there. Surely that's not what you wanted. Yeah. That's what I want you to do. So how did Abraham respond? Early the next morning. Abraham got up and he saddled his donkey and he took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and he saw the place off in the distance. And he said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship And then we will come back to you. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah, we're going to go off here. We got a little little thing we got to do. Uh, God told us to do, but 
We're both going to come back to you. And Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and he placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. And as the two of them were together, Isaac spoke up and he said to his father, Abraham, father. Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Can you imagine? Can you imagine that that walk? Can you imagine what Abraham was going through? Here's his son. Hey, Dad. Yeah, I know we're going to offer a sacrifice. I see everything uh, we need. Got all the the wood and got the the fire. You know, hey, we're all set except for, you know, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. God will. And when they reached the place where God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and he arranged the wood on it. And he bound his son Isaac and he laid him on the altar on the top of the wood. Dad, 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 daddy, what are you doing? Daddy, daddy. And then he reached out his hand And he took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I I am, here I am. He replied, do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. What was all this about? It was a test for Father Abraham. Was he up to the task that God was calling him to do, to lead the people, to be that father of his people of a great nation? And he had to be obedient to God. You see that fear of God and that obedience to God are one and the same thing. That God calls us to obedience. And Abraham looked up. And there in the thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns. And he went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time. And he said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Here we have in the Old Testament a foreshadowing of something that's going to happen in the New Testament on a greater and a grander scale. And that's what happens often in the, in the Old Testament. These things that happen physically and they happen, but they're symbolic and they're foretelling something that is greater and grander that's going to come. You see, there is another father, a father in heaven who gave up his son, his one and only son whom he loved. And this time he didn't take him off of that sacrifice. He allowed his son to die on the cross for our behalf. So there can be forgiveness of our sins. And that son was not only a sacrificial lamb. He was also a good shepherd who leads his people in the way that we should go. So we pray, Lord, 
Lead us not into temptation, but lead us through this evil, wicked world in which we live. Show us the way to go. Give us strength, Lord. Help us to resist that t- temptation and to overcome Satan and to be obedient to you. Because there's a reward ahead that's worth any sacrifices we have to make now. So how do we live? In Ephesians in Ephesians uh, 6... Paul tells us that we're in the midst of a spiritual warfare. You know, and we need spiritual weapons. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For in our struggle is, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world. And against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. So that when the day of evil comes, and it is here, friends, look around you. That day of evil is is here. You will be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith from which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the spirit on all occasions. Lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from the evil one. With all kinds of prayers and all kinds of requests. And with this in mind, be alert. And always keep on praying for all of the saints. Our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed. Holy is your name. Your kingdom come just on earth, just like it is in heaven. And your will be done down here, just like it is up there. Give us each and every day our our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom. And the power. And the glory. Forever.